to us in Adalit. To introduce Dr. Navoda, I suppose she needs no introduction, but as a formal introduction, I would like to mention that she's a consultant pediatric endocrinologist uh, who works at Lady Ridgeway Hospital, Colombo. She has obtained her MD and a diploma in child health. She's also a fellow of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health UK and a fellow of the Sri Lanka College of Endocrinologists. She has done her training in pediatric en endocrinology at Birmingham Children's Hospital UK. She has published many peer reviewed uh, published in many peer reviewed journals covering almost all aspects of pediatric endocrinology. And she has also received the presidential awards for scientific publications in 2017 and also 2018. Her current research interests include disorders of sexual development, disorders of calcium metabolism, and growth disorders. Over to you, Dr. Navoda. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, let me thank the Sri Lanka College of Ob Obstetricians uh, for inviting me to talk to you in PCOS in adolescence. And also thank you, Gihan, for that uh, beautiful overview on which I can build up on why how we are different from adult PCOS. So... Right, it is a most common endocrine uh, condition affecting 3.4 to 19.6% of adolescent girls. Yes, it is common in adolescent, um, elderly females as well as it is common in adolescent girls. And it is also associated with significant morbidity in future that is impaired reproductive health, psychological dysfunction, mainly anxiety and depression due to their um, appearance metabolic syndrome, cardiovascular disease, and increased cancer risk. So in adolescents with type 2 diabetes, PCO is having highest prevalence. And also it is heritable, and heritability is approximately 70%. The problem is the symptoms overlap with common gynecological problems in adolescents. And we know that adolescence is the period from 10 to 19 years. And this is the uh, period where they have changes in um, growth hormone IGF-1, resulting in in increased, hyper, increased androgen levels, as well as this is the time of insulin resistance. So the features of normal puberty or normal adolescence overlap with most of the adult diagnostic criteria of PCOS. So it may be difficult to differentiate actually a child have, whether an ad adolescent has PCOS or not. Because of that, we have several diagnostic criteria which I will discuss later. So the diagnosis is depending on evidence of ovulated dysfunction and androgen excess. We need both these criteria to diagnose PCOS. Even though the pathogenesis is not well understood, we know it is a complex, complex interaction between genetics and environmental factors. So accepted genet uh, etiological theories are the disorders of neuroendocrine gonadotrophin secretion, hyperandrogenism, insulin resistance or combination of all these. So the risk factors include, yes, genetics and the antenatal exposure to androgens, antenatal exposure to smoking and adverse lifestyle, premature adrenarche, which is commonly seen in babies born prematurely and also the children who are born with intrauterine growth restriction. They are the group which has a higher risk of getting premature adrenarche and also risk of insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, as well as PCOS. And the sustained adiposity in large for gestational girls, as well as 
endocrine disruptors like bisphenol. So these are the uh, risk factors associated with future PCOS. So we have a definite role here to prevent them getting PCOS during the adult life by preventing, preventing them getting obese, especially those who were born uh, with intrauterine growth restriction. We don't want them to cross the centiles and achieve the normal weight. Now, the problem in our country is we would like to see chubby, uh, obese children rather than the marasmic looking thin fellows. The problem with IUGR and preterm babies is they are born anyway uh, with a low birth weight. Sometimes these midwives trouble these mothers to overfeed to bring them to a greener area which is going to be detrimental. However much we ask them not to do so, still there's a very big bar barrier between us and the health, some health, uh, grassroots level healthcare professionals because they only look at the growth chart, not the growth trajectory. They look at the colors, they don't look at the um, growth rate. If the patient is born in the red area, we would prefer that baby to be in the red area rather than in the green area. If a baby is born in a green area, we don't want that baby to be in the purple area. Or at the same time, we don't want the baby to be, yes, we don't want the baby to come to red area in the growth chart, but our midwives and the healthcare workers want everybody to be in, in the green zone. And that is a very big risk factor uh, for their uh, future risk of PCOS. So we always encourage the babies to be small if they are born small because of the metabolic syndrome as well as future PCOS in girls. These endocrine disruptors, if I explain a little bit more, bisphenol A like substances, when they get exposed to these endocrine disrupting chemicals during infancy, and there are studies to suggest that it that itself increase the risk of PCOS in adult life and also um, exposure to gluten like uh, food as well as dairy products have also increased the risk of PCOS in later life but there are not enough studies to confirm those. The diagnosis in uh, diagnosis of PCOS is challenging in, uh, in uh, adolescents because greater than 50% of menstrual cycles are anovulatory in the first two years of after menarche. And there are non-pathologic non acne and mild hirsutism are common during the peripubertal years because of the hyperandrogenism, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is seen in uh, adolescents, due, especially during the peripubertal period due to increased growth hormone and IGF-1 levels. And they have and we don't have norm, uh, normative data to see whether these androgen levels are really abnormal. And children develop Physiologic insulin resistance, as I described earlier, during puberty. And ovarian size appears to be maximal in the perimenarchal period. So because of that, they, it is challenging. So adolescence polycystic ovary syndrome, according to the International Evidence-Based Guideline, BMC, is describing some uh, clinical criteria. So before we come to a diagnosis, we need to... Uh, do a proper clinical evaluation with a complete medical history because late onset congenital adrenal hyperplasia also can present with the same symptoms and also hyperprolactemia and thyroid dysfunction. Androgen steroids and some anti seizure medications also can cause hirsutism. And it is important that we take a detailed family history because it is running in families and heritability and the nature of the menstrual cycles, history of any predisposing factors to PCOS, excessive weight gain during the uh, immediate uh, postnatal period, birth weight, uh, maturity, and antenatal exposure, clinical signs of hyperandrogenism or insulin resistance also should be evaluated initially. So the criteria required are, first one is irregular menstrual cycles and ovulatory dysfunction. So menstrual cycle intervention interval varies according to the time post menarche.
adopted 83 adolescents in Italy have showed that after three to four years post ovulation is only in 20% of the menstrual cycles during the first year of the post menarche. Uh, hi, uh, uh, primary oh, amenorrhea by 15 years. Good.
point one to point two. Now, androstenic ion and DHEAs would be important, but those are not diagnostic criteria that will exclude the androgen secreting tumors. And as you know, we have to stop oral contraceptive fields at least for three months before assessing the androgens. And also we have to use sensitive assays. However, we don't have enough reference data uh, to call it abnormal. So testosterone more than 33, these are the suggested cutoff values, more than 1.15 nanomoles per liter, or androstenedione more than 40 nanomoles per liter, LHFSH ratio more than 1.23 has the sensitivity of 63.2 or specificity of 84% in PCOS diagnosis. Clinical hyperandrogenism, we have to have severe acne because mild to moderate acne is quite common during the um, peripubertal uh, life. 10 or more facial lesions with moderate to severe inflammatory acne. That is how it is defined as uh, severe acne for adolescent PCOS. Hirsutism, FG score of more than four to six indicate hirsutism, but this depends on the culture as well as the uh, ethnicity um, because certain ethnicities, hirsutism is quite common for, for a country like us. According to Professor Vijay Ratna, we take more than eight as abnormal, but according to the literature, it, it says more than four to six. And adolescents with isolated hyperandrogenism, clinical or biochemical, and irregular menstrual cycles, if these things are coming in isolation, if those things are not coming together, we consider them as having at risk of PCOS rather than PCOS. Because, because of this overlap, we don't want to underdiagnose this group of patients because of the future health comorbidities. So... Even though we don't label them as having PCOS, we call them at risk of PCOS and managed the same way like a PCOS girl. Yes, we don't label, but we keep them as at risk. The management is same. Lifestyle, metformin, oral contraceptive pills, depending on the, uh, the clinical situation. Acne, it, uh, the other problem with acne is it could be due to premature adrenarche. We call premature adrenarche as having balance of sexual pubic hair or axillary hair before eight years in females. Adren adrenal hyperandrogenism, which is increased height velocity, development of male sexual characteristics in peripubertal males and hirsutism and clitoromegaly in prepubertal females. We call it adrenal hyperandrogenism. Always we have to look for an underlying cause usually a tumor or congenital adrenal hyperplasia or precocious puberty. So the modified ferryman galway score is used. There is no optimal cutoff for adolescents of different ethnicities. Mild hirsutism may reflect ethnic variation or normal pubertal progression. And also it must be distinguished from hypertrichosis. Most of the time we get the referral of, uh, with a complaint of hirsutism to see the patient has hypertrichosis. Hypertrichosis is most of the time idiopathic um, due to um, Asian population. The things that are not included in the diagnostic criteria are pelvic ultrasound features if the gynecological age is less than eight years. Antimolarian hormone. Yes, it is high in uh, patients with PCOS, but we don't know how to differentiate it from the uh, pubertal to PCOS because anyway, the AMH is high at that age. Insulin, the features associated with insulin resistance are not included as diagnostic criteria and also the blood tests are not included in the criteria, but we need them to exclude other conditions. Ultrasound scan done trans abnormality, not transvaginally, affecting the accuracy of the finding. And the presence of polycystic ovary morph morph morphology in healthy adolescents can be transient. And it is useful to exclude 
other pathologies of irregular bleeding one is absent uterus one is hypoplastic uterus and the other one is tumors or um, adrenal hyperplasia having said that we have to exclude non classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia Clitoromegaly and early morning follicular phase 17 OHP more than 6 nanomoles per liter is diagnostic if you don't know whether the patient is in the follicular phase or not because of the long duration of amenorrhea we might have to go ahead with the synactin stimulation test to see the 30 minutes LH uh, sorry 17 hydroxy progesterone level and also exclude hypothyroidism, hyperprolactinemia. And if you see a girl with short stature and obesity or associated with other features of Cushing's disease, do a uh, or, or, overnight dexamethasone suppression test. And other rare conditions are glucocorticoid resistance and androgen secreting tumors. In patients with glucocorticoid resistance, um, they have hyperandrogenism, hypertension, but they do not have features of Cushing's. Tests that we generally do are LHFSH, as Rihan suggested, thyroid function centralactin, overnight dexamethasone suppression test, depending on the clinical suspicion, 17 OHP, and we have to look for other comorbidities, look for diabetes, look for hyperlipidemia, and look for hypertension. Even without features of PCOS, most obese children do have these comorbidities. So any, even though... PCOS is common in obese children. We have we do have uh, lean PCOS. The problem is sometimes they get re referred to us because of the ovarian morphology seen on the ultrasound scan. Sometimes they do not fulfill all the criteria. Again, we keep them under the at-risk umbrella. Non-classic CH and PCOS, they have similar clinical presentation with hyperandrogenism and oligomenorrhea. They do have insulin resistance, polycystic morphology, and it, the most important clinical feature here is clitoromegaly. The patients with PCOS do not have clitoromegaly, but CH. And most important biochemical finding would be 17 OHP. So these are the differences. If you want to uh, compare non-classic CH uh, from PCOS, the rare symptoms and the common symptoms. Um, there are percentages. I don't know whether you, I think you can read, yes. Um, hyperandrogenic patients, 1 to 10 percent. Reproductive age, 0.1 to 0 0.5. So these are common features of uh, comparison. The menstrual irregularities, very common in PCOS, but common in non-classic. Polycystic ovaries, common in non-classic, very common in PCOS. Likewise, we do have comparisons to uh, differentiate non-classic from PCOS, but there's a very big overlap. So we do have to evaluate for metabolic syndrome, glucose impaired glucose tolerance, type 2 diabetes, depression and anxiety, and eating disorders. Both groups of patients girls with P diagnosed patients with PCOS as well as at-risk patients require to evaluate for comorbidities. So at-risk group have features of PCOS but do not meet the diagnostic criteria and cannot be diagnosed during adolescence unless both criteria are present but need reassessment every two to three years to see whether they fulfill the criteria, all criteria to uh, categorize under PCOS. So this is what we do. The patient with isolated menstrual irregularities, but no hyperandrogenism, hyperandrogenism and irregular menstrual cycles, hyperandrogenism and menstrual irregularities, the first year post menarche, hyperandrogenism and menstrual cycles, 21 to less than 25 days, one to three years post menarche, metabolic syndrome and menstrual irregularities, those are, those are the patients at, with at-risk PCOS and follow up and advise them to uh, follow a healthy lifestyle because of the future risk of subfertility as well as complications of metabolic syndrome and other associated endocrine disturbances uh, with obesity. As Gihan very well uh, highlighted, 
the lifestyle is the most important uh, management option followed by low dose oral contraceptive pills here in adolescents the first line is to start contraceptive pills with lower estrogen content 20 to 30 and we do not recommend antiandrogens with OCP with antiandrogens as the first line that would be our second line first line is to start with low dose oral contraceptive or low dose estrogen with contraceptive pills and followed by if they do not respond together with antiandrogen. Metformin again as an insulin insensitizer as well as it helps us to manage obesity in children and children more than 12 years are eligible to, to be used to use get GLP-1 analogs that helps with uh, obesity management. Antiandrogens we use spironolactone and um, flutamide and finasteride Com or combination of the above can be used for the management. And there are two open label randomized trials using uh, combined oral, oral contraceptives with a low dose combination of spiromate, that is um, spironolactone, pioglitazone, and metformin. There's only a few randomized trials with effective uh, outcome, but this has not come as a um, management option in the guidelines, but can be used. So in summary, symptoms overlap with common gynecological problems in adolescents. Both criteria are needed for the diagnosis. If, uh, so we do not use ultrasound evidence of polycystic ovary morphology. Uh, a definitive diagnosis is not needed to initiate treatment. And the differ the diagnosis of PCOS while offering symptomatic management. They need frequent follow-up for symptomatology. Features of metabolic syndrome should not be used for diagnostic purposes. Other causes of hyperandrogenemia and irregular periods should be ruled out before PCOS is established. And this is the summary. Unable to progress, diagnose PCOS, first year post menarche, second year post menarche, diagnose if PCOS, PCOS if the following two criteria are there. Third year post menarche until 19 years of age, diagnose PCOS if the two criteria are there. Thank you very much for your attention. You want the slide? Okay. I will ask a fleet of questions uh, uh, if you can answer. I'm not expecting answer because uh, sometimes we may be equally gray about certain areas. We were learned about infantile polycystic ovaries. Are you familiar with that setup, which gives uh, primary amenorrhea? Uh, actually, what they say now is during the infancy, the, there are some children who do have polycystic uh, ovaries ovaries polycystic like ovaries some ovaries some, some children do get cysts but they don't talk about the risk of polycystic ovary disease later in later on in life but it's a known cause of primary amenorrhea i haven't uh, uh, read the people that, who so. don't come with the periods infantile polycystic ovaries is one of the known cause the problem is sir we haven't done the ultrasound scan in those patients to see whether they has had polycystic ovary uh, symptoms in the infancy. Now, in that case, we will have to... No, I mean, infancy is when they don't get their menarche by 16. This is the appearance of the ovaries. By so, 16? Yeah. That's what you mean. So, that's what I mean. Yeah. We don't diagnose it in the yeah. young age. Yeah. But when they come with primary amenorrhea, yes. I have seen the patient who never had their periods. Yes, yes, sir. Like, actually, with, uh, tell, you have mentioned. Yes. It's and then the role of prolactin. Do you seems to not take in the prolactin assay as a part of PCOS assay? No, we do it to exclude prolactinemia, prolactinoma. But what about the 10% people who can show a, a sunrise in prolactin levels? But it's not taken as a diagnostic, diagnostic criteria, but we do it to exclude the cause of primary amenorrhea or secondary amenorrhea in a 
uh, child be- uh, in a ch- uh, girl with childbearing age so there are no treatment needed but they you know no if yeah. if the pro- if if we see high prolactin levels first of all we have to exclude whether yeah. the patient has taken any medications which can affect prolactin and if the teeters are going up we do uh, brain imaging the other thing i want to share my knowledge with you because we have written few cases if there's an androgen secreting tumor also which can mimic hirsutism yeah. they will invariably have masculinization and clitoromegaly yes compared yeah. to pcos which they don't never have, yeah. go to that level so it's a very clear cut discrimination and, and the voice change if you see that yeah. don't think about pcos go for the testosterone selective venous sampling and identify the and androgen secreting tumor or ch it's most likely it is ch uh, if they present at that age but yeah. earlier what area is ch yeah. and to our side it's an it's, an, uh, it's and it's secreting tumor. tumor but the, in our case also sir especially the children less than 3 years when yeah. they come with virilization yes they don't we don't talk about P, uh, pcos adolescent pcos that's not the topic hmm. but if they come around 3 4 years of age with andro- uh, with hyperandrogenism like masculinization they, even children do have it voice change and virilization and pubic hair yeah. the two things that, that we do is to exclude adrenal tumor and ch yeah right and the other thing i think it'll focus on both of you uh, women gain hair and lose the hair on the important area where the hair should be present in other words alopecia, alopecia. so what do you do for that you get hair but not in the places you are you want to have that right? they lose bunches of hair and uh, sometimes when they lose hair i put them on anti androgens right and uh, that's one of the routine treatment of the skin specialist right frontal balding mm. losing hair thin hair uh, that is one so what is your opinion about it yeah and finally both of you i want to ask what's the risk of nash non alcoholic steatohepatitis in these patients yeah there's a risk of nash non alcoholic steatohepatitis what is your mean age in a child who has uh, adolescent pcos what is their mean age of developing fatty liver grade 3 and not you have any idea about it boy Leech levels are high. Hmm. Yeah, you take it. Uh, they have PCOS like picture and uh, they have um, hirsutism. They have high risk of diabetes. Those are insulin resistant syndromes. Even though they are lean, they do present sometimes with. Uh, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Uh, very few of them have it, but most of the obese ones, I would say, ninety percent of the obese ones, depending on the sonographer, we do see uh, poly- non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Thank you very much, Navada, because those are my personal questions. And uh, shall we ask the audience whether they have any questions? And sir, about that. Um, the libido question i thought uh, in other countries they use dhes to improve the libido in females so, and also some men, some people use low dose of testosterone together with the uh, hrt to improve libido so yes dhes products are available not here yes is it sir? thank you very much i think the answer to dr karunanand's question is that the level of the testosterone which is determined 
I mean, generally, we know that uh, most of the PCOS will not have very high testosterone levels, isn't it, dear? Or oh, what is your... Yeah. No, but then uh, an ovulation also part and parcel of that, no? So all the, it's a relative question, you know, you have to ask. Uh, Shamun just asked the audience, uh, our virtual listeners, whether they have any questions. Do we have any questions from our virtual listeners? Right, we conclude the session. Nothing on the chat as well, no? Yeah. As, if, as we have no more questions, I think uh, we can close uh, the session today. So um, I would like to deliver the vote of thanks on behalf of the Sri Lankan College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Firstly, of course, I would like to thank our two speakers, uh, Dr. Navoda Atapattu, as well as Dr. Champi Gihan. Uh, Dr. Navoda Atapattu, thank you very much for being our guest today and honoring uh, my request and the request of the college to deliver your very interesting lecture on adolescent PCOS. And I'm also very grateful to Dr. Champi Gihan, who came all the way from Peradeniya upon our request to uh, physically deliver his lecture. And uh, once again, both your lectures were very interesting, uh, very stimulating, and really helped us all sort of update our knowledge on PCOS today. Um, I also like to uh, extend my gratitude uh, to our sponsors who uh, have been very kind enough to sponsor uh, our second uh, lecture, hybrid lecture uh, for, for the year 2023. So, we have Mr. Gihan Lochanasan, who is uh, the country head Bharat Serums, Vaccines Limited India, and Praveen Herat, the business manager of Sioka Private Limited, for sponsoring today's event. Thank you very much. Um, I also would like to uh, thank everybody at the college who have rendered their help in organizing today's event, as well as those uh, at Sri Javadanapura General Hospital for assisting me in coordinating this event. Uh, and finally, this event wouldn't be a success without our participants. So thank you all for who are here physically, as well as those who joined online with us. Um, I hope again, once again, these lectures were useful for you all in updating your knowledge on PCOS. Um, so now that we've come to the end of it, uh, uh, I would like to close the session and invite all those present physically for dinner, which we have arranged on the ground floor. Thank you and good night.